ES Audio. From the Evening Standard in London, I'm John Weeks, and this is The Leader. As the UK continues to mourn the death of Queen Elizabeth II, we're looking at one of the great things synonymous with Her Majesty, her adorable corgis. Throughout her reign, she and her pets became inseparable. The dogs would travel with her in cars and on planes, and she moved between royal estates across the United Kingdom. And they even made appearances at key events throughout the Queen's reign, including a starring role alongside James Bond in the halls of Buckingham Palace for the opening ceremony of the 2012 Olympics. So, how did the corgis become such a popular symbol of Queen Elizabeth? And what will happen to her remaining two dogs now she's passed away? Joining me now is Ethan Croft from the Evening Standard's Londoner's Diary to give us a bit of a corgi history lesson. So, Ethan, the corgis were absolutely synonymous with Queen Elizabeth. When did her love of the dogs begin? Well, it began at quite a tender age, seven, when Princess Elizabeth and her sister Margaret lived in 195 Piccadilly, which is sadly no longer there anymore. It's a large house in central London. And their neighbour at the time had a Welsh corgi whom they befriended. And then shortly after that, their father, the Duke of York, bought a corgi called Dookie. That came home and that was the first corgi she ever had. And she, she kept them for another 90 years after that until her death last week. Was this the first time the public would have seen the Queen with one of her corgis or was that later down the line? Well, there were lots of photographs of the Princess Elizabeth and her sister Margaret with the dogs, which we now find in the archives. But obviously at the time in the 1930s, I mean, it was 1933 when they got Dookie, they were very much background royals. This was before the abdication crisis when her uncle gave up the throne and then her father became king and she became the heir. So it wasn't really until, I suppose, um, the Princess Elizabeth became more public figure as heir that the corgis became synonymous with her. I mean, she got her first one when she was the first dog of her own when she was 18 and that was a birthday present and at that point she was already joining the women's branch of the army making public broadcast during the war so it's been pretty much synonymous with her since she became heir. They weren't afraid to be in the limelight were they? They appeared (laughs) alongside the Queen at actually quite a lot of events in in a lot of cases. What are some of those? Well there was a famous incident when Barry, one of the corgis, that corgi was particularly fond of photobombing. And, and when the Queen took a large photograph, an official photograph with the England rugby team in 2003 after they won the World Cup, Barry very much photobombed the team and got right into the shot and uh, raised a smile from them. I mean, they were often seen being manhandled on and off jets and into royal cars at diplomatic occasions. They were described as her moving carpet on one occasion because the Queen would walk around and she would just be surrounded with them. She had as many as 10 dogs at one point, so you can imagine they were hard to miss. And I understand as well that the Queen actually used them as an icebreaker, a sort of icebreaker for some quite important guests at times. Yeah, so, I mean, there are quite a few stories, some of them lighthearted, some of them actually slightly more moving. There's a prominent frontline surgeon um, who works in war zones called David Knott, and in his memoir, he writes about the time that the Queen welcomed him to Buckingham Palace, and he was very upset and very nervous and very traumatised by all the things he'd seen in the city of Aleppo in Syria. And in order to break the ice, the Queen opened a, a box of dog biscuits on the table and welcomed the corgis in and, and encouraged him to feed them, and they just sat stroking the dogs and chatting about that for the duration of the visit. And he said, it very much put him at ease. Obviously, throughout her reign, she would move between places like Windsor and, of course, Balmoral. Would she take them with her when she went? Because they're surely the most well-travelled dogs in the country. Yes, I think they're probably the most well-travelled pets in history. Um, The Queen uh, took them everywhere with her. And even her honeymoon with Prince Philip in 1947, they had the dogs along then, even though Prince Philip wasn't so much a fan of them as the Queen, he found their yapping quite annoying and referred to them as the bloody dogs. It seemed over the years as if she just accumulated more and more corgis. You know, we saw more and more in, in the pictures that we did see of the dogs. But how many did she breed? How many did she she have at the peak of corgi ownership for her? There is a, a family tree of the corgis because all of them pretty much were bred from the original 18th birthday present corgi, Susan. And that bloodline continues, I, I think, until a few years ago. But around 2009, 2010, she stopped breeding the dogs because obviously there was considerations of old age. And the high point was in the middle of her reign when she had around 10 dogs at any one time. That included corgis, also dorgies, which were um, a crossbreed between the corgi and the dasher 
mentioned, a, a dog breed that Princess Margaret liked to keep. But by the end, it was, I think, two corgis and one dorgy left with the Queen when she was at Balmoral earlier this month. Do you think she effectively boosted the popularity of corgis throughout her reign just by owning them and, and having them so much in the limelight? I think so, yeah. I mean, it's quite extraordinary to think that there was a cartoon film aimed at children called The Queen's Corgi, released only a few years ago, in which they became essentially a, a cartoon character for kids. I can't really imagine that having happened if it wasn't for the Queen and her sort of patronage of them. So the question a lot of people are asking, what happens to them now? Well, there was a lot of speculation on this because various members of the royal family are animal lovers. They are you know, sort of a countryside family. King Charles has been a patron of animal causes for a long time. But Prince Andrew was the one who gifted the final two corgis to the Queen as a present after the death of Prince Philip. And it's been announced in the past 24 hours that Prince Andrew and his ex-wife, Sarah Duchess of York, will be looking after the dogs at the Royal Lodge um, for the foreseeable future. And are there any dog breeds we know King Charles is a particular fan of? I don't know. The Windsor family has chopped and changed over the years. They used to enjoy the company of Shih Tzus and um, Labradors. Then it moved to Corgis. So who knows what comes next? I I'm not sure, but I'm sure we'll find out soon. Let's take a break now. In part two, we hear from Corgi expert Diana King, who tells us how the Queen chose stud dogs for breeding. They used to go to Nancy Fenwick's cottage in Windsor Great Park so the Queen could interview the dogs. Joining me now is Diana King, ex-chairman of the Welsh Corgi League, a group for owners of the breed. So first of all, Diana, corgis became really synonymous with the Queen. Do you think their appearances alongside her made them more popular in the UK? Well, they did in the early years, yes. I mean, when she first had a corgi, I mean, it's like most things um, in this sort of world that when a person of note sort of has something, everybody else wants it. And so, yes, when she first got her corgi, then the numbers of corgis being bred went up considerably and everybody wanted one. And has there been any sort of interaction over the years between the Queen and the Welsh Corgi League? I mean, we used to keep her informed. I mean, we produce a handbook every year, so she used to get a copy of that. And um, we produce, at the moment, two newsletters a year. Back in the day, it used to be about three newsletters a year. And so she always got a copy of that. So she was always well up on all the dogs that were sort of in the breed. And this is where she sort of gained her, her stud dogs from because she kept abreast of how things were going. I mean, she used to hold an audience at Windsor Castle when she was thinking of mating a bitch. And she was very knowledgeable on the breed and all their pedigrees and that. And she used to invite people with their stud dogs to come to Windsor Castle. Nancy Fennick. Nancy Fennick was the lady who looked after the corgis. And they used to go to Nancy Fennick's cottage in Windsor Great Park so the Queen could interview the dogs. So do you think their legacy as royal dogs will live on? I think it probably will. I mean, during lockdown, um, they became very popular. I mean, back in the 1990s, the breed really was in decline. And I think a lot had to do with that was the tail docking ban. And I think that came in in 2007. And a lot of the older breeders sort of said, right, if we can't dock the tails, we're not going to breed anymore. Basically, the original Pembroke Corgi didn't have a tail. But in their wisdom, back in the 1920s, the Welsh farmers mated the cardigan corgi that has a tail to the Pembroke to improve the conformation on the Pembroke. And in so doing, we got the tail gene. And they said, well, that's not a problem. We will just dock them. And that went on and say, until 2007, when the government brought in that tail docking was banned. So is corgi breeding going well now? Do you think there will be another resurgence for them? Unfortunately, they've become popular in the wrong way. Um, as I said, during lockdown, everybody wanted a dog. So people, if they didn't go for the designer breeds like cockapoos and what have you, they wanted a corgi. Our breeders were in decline. I mean, I had my last litter seven years ago. and Basically, I'm too old now to breed a litter. But the number of reputable breeders, I think I could probably count on one hand. Um, majority of the puppies that are around at the moment are coming out of Wales because I believe the Welsh government gave the Welsh farmers' wives special dispensation to breed litters, not just Pembrokes, but any breed of dog. 
And so there's an awful lot of breeding of Pembroke corgis going on in Wales. And unfortunately, when I see what's coming out, it's not your typical Pembroke, which is very sad. I feel very sad for the breed. So, Diana, what's your advice for anyone looking to buy a corgi puppy today? You're better off to get in touch with uh, Mrs. Sue Coulson, who's our puppy coordinator. But I believe at the moment, um, you know, there's probably more people wanting puppies than the reputable breeders are breeding. I did speak to the lady of the rescue. Apparently, when I spoke to her the other day, she said she rehomed about 25 corgis last year. And she's got over 100 people waiting for a rescue corgi. And, you know, she just hasn't got the dogs to fulfill the people that want them. There's more on this story online at standard.co.uk. That's The Leader. Thanks for listening. We're back tomorrow afternoon at four o'clock.